Well, happy for another opportunity we have to study in the book of Acts today. Uh, we're studying in Acts chapter 13, and last time we left off at about verse 25, looking at Paul's sermon there. Before we uh, enter into our study at this hour, we want to begin with the word of prayer. I'll ask Brother Bill to direct our minds. Amen. All right, we're looking in chapter 13 where Paul's begun his uh, first missionary journey. He and Barnabas and John Mark uh, were traveling and went to uh, uh, Cyprus. And then from Cyprus, they sailed to Paphos. And John Mark left and went back to Jerusalem. And the others continued on to Antioch of Pisidia in Galatia. And there in that uh, city, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas went into the synagogue and began their uh, work there in preaching the gospel. And I'll just read up to where we left off, starting in verse 14. It says, But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. And Paul stood up, and motioning with his hand, he said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. And for a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. And after these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. And then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the offspring of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. So he goes through the history of Israel to begin his sermon and shows God's loving care and grace in providing for them and preserving them and giving... Uh, them a king after his own heart, David, and through David he promised to send the Christ into the world, the Savior, and he says God has done that. He has sent that Savior. Talk about a bombshell to drop there in the synagogue. The Savior has come from David. Jesus of Nazareth is that one. And he tells them, uh, first John the Baptist had to do his preparatory work. And what did John the Baptist, that great prophet, say? He said, I'm not the Christ. I'm not even worthy uh, 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 to untie his shoes, his sandals. There's one much greater that's coming and standing among you. They was talking about Jesus of Nazareth. When Jesus came to be baptized, he said, I, I have need to be baptized by you, right? He recognized, I'm not worthy. <laughs> and he said, we must fulfill all righteousness. So John permitted it and, and baptized him. And God sent the Holy Spirit upon Christ. And John saw it descend like a dove upon him. And he could bear witness, this is the Lamb of God. So John pointed that out. And again, we have an abbreviated account of Paul's sermons. Don't you imagine Paul went into some of those things when he was telling this story? We're just getting the bare outline of what he said that day. But he shows you an organized way to present the gospel to people. And uh, the, really the organized way that you see over and over again that they used to present it. He was foretold in the Old Testament. John the Baptist made the way ready for him, and then he came to the nation. And brethren, sons of Abraham's family, 
and those among you who fear God, to us the word of this salvation is sent out. He says, I want you to know, all of you Jewish people here that are descendants of Abraham, this great salvation that God has planned from the beginning and promised is now sent out for people to enjoy right now. That's what this gospel that I'm preaching is all about. It's the way of salvation in Christ uh, that has been sent out. He gives that noble title to them. He, he's talking about their best qualities that they should act upon and live up to. Isn't that an excellent form of uh, motivation for people? <laughs> think the best of them. Expect the best. When you're raising your children, you think about the best that they can be and what they can live up to and so forth. You know, all that you expect of them. That's the way he addresses these Jewish people. You're sons of Abraham, that man of faith. I want you to know that salvation is now here. It's been sent out into the world by God. He sent his apostles out to announce that news about how you can be saved in Christ. And you need to have respect for God's will. And he doesn't just speak to the Jews, but all of you Gentiles that are here, they're the ones that fear God. The Gentiles that are there in the synagogue. The salvation message has been sent out. And you need to accept this great commission that we've got because it's for all men, Jews and Gentiles alike. And he tells them about the death of Christ. So we mentioned they probably, even in Galatia, had heard about Jesus of Nazareth, this man that did all those miracles and everything, that he got rejected and crucified. You know, that they would have heard that story. And a lot of people would say, well, he's definitely not the Christ then. He got crucified, right? Emphasis on, like Peter did, showing them it was necessary that that happened. That was actually the plan of God, that he come, be rejected, be crucified, and rise again the third day, and then begin to reign at God's right hand in heaven. It says, for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers recognize neither him nor the utterance of the prophets which are read every Sabbath fulfilling these by condemning him said this all happened the way God planned it to happen it wasn't an accident that Jesus was crucified God sent him at, in such a way and at such a time that this was going to be the outcome he knew exactly what he was doing and he saw it all ahead of time and Jesus came, and even though the prophets talk about the Christ over 300 times in the Old Testament, they did not recognize Him. Because they only wanted to see all of the power of the Christ and how He was going to deliver Israel and uh, rule over the nations and all of the positive things they could see. But they couldn't see the suffering servant part that he was going to get rejected and bear everybody's sin and be nailed to a cross and be put to death, be surrounded by his enemies and all of that. They, they didn't put those two together, so they didn't recognize Jesus when he came. They, uh, they could, you could only see it afterwards, you know, the, uh, at least most people could only see it after the gospel got announced and it was explained and you got the full understanding of the mystery after his resurrection from the dead. So they didn't recognize Christ. He didn't meet their preconceived ideas. And uh, they hadn't taken to heart all of those prophecies. They ignored the humiliating prophecies and the talk, talk about his death. And they didn't know uh, the prophets, though they read them out loud every Sabbath day in the synagogue. Could you imagine people listening to the Bible every week and they still don't get it? I can, <laughs> right? Oh, it's happening all over the world right now. People are reading about the, you know, what you're supposed to do to be saved and the church and all of that, and they've got preconceived ideas, and it blocks out them being able to see what the Bible clearly says, right? And they did that with the Messianic prophecies, did the same thing. They read it every week, and it was right there in front of them, and yet they missed it. And... Now God has sent these apostles out to put it all together for them so they can see it. And once you put it together, the veil does come off, right? You see clearly 
from Genesis all the way to Malachi, it is foretelling the death of Christ and his resurrection and salvation in that way. It's all in there. Right. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. Remember, this is, we're reading volume two of Luke. So we can go back, and Luke has already told us that whole story, right? In, in the first volume, the book, book of Luke, uh, Gospel of Luke, he's told about how that all happened. The Jews, uh, they looked for grounds to put him to death. They had the false witnesses. They, they just tried all, every different way to get him condemned on the day of uh, a Passover, and they couldn't come up with anything that would stick. The witnesses contradicted each other. It didn't all line up right to be able to get him for insurrection against the government. And they took him to Herod, and Herod said, I find no guilt in him. They took him to Pilate, and Pilate said, I find no guilt in him. They finally had to say, he's a blasphemer, right? And that, that's not even true, right? And so then they just, with political force, said, we're going to tell Caesar on you. If you don't put him to death, and then he put he washes his hands in front of him and says he's innocent, but because you insist, I'm going to put him to death. And you think maybe in Galatia they hadn't heard all of that part? <laughs> They'd heard about this Jesus of Nazareth, he got crucified. But did they know the details about the trial and all? But Paul can lay all of that out for him here and show them. He was put to death even though Pilate didn't want to do it. They were all saying he was innocent. And they condemned an innocent person that died for our sins, not for his own sins. And when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, so everything had to be fulfilled. <laughs> and what, doesn't that make that cry in John's gospel where Jesus saw the final words? It is finished. I've done everything. i got to go. They've gambled for my clothes. They pierced my hands and feet. They put the crown of thorns on my head. They've done everything the Old Testament said was going to happen. It's finished. Now I can give up my spirit and die. It all happened according to a plan. And it didn't just happen by accident. And can't you just imagine Paul quoting those passages in the synagogue? He knows them better than I do. I'm sure he grew up. That was all he studied was the Old Testament. He'd go to Psalms 2, Psalms 22, Psalms 16, Psalms, you know, so on and on. 118, 110, all of them lay it out. Lay it out in perfect, perfect everything that happened at the cross. And I said, not a bone was broken. They gambled for his garments. You can read that in Psalms 22. They, uh, they, they mocked him. Psalms, or Isaiah 50, plucked out his beard. And spit on him. That tells about that. Uh, about the crucifixion and how he died for other people. And nobody understood it. Buried in a rich man's tomb, even though he should have been with us wicked in his death. And uh, again, Luke seems to, again, abbreviate the sermon because he's already told us the detail of that <laughs> in the book of Luke. Anybody else have a thought you want to add? Yes, Bill. They took him down off that cross and laid him in a tomb. And I mean, there's a lot about that tomb, too. Exactly where it's located, they knew about. And brand new. Nobody had ever been laying in it before. Had that great stone. They prepared his body. But God raised him up from the dead. That wasn't the end of the story about Jesus being crucified and dying and being buried, like the scripture said. But he was also raised up, like was foretold. But God raised him up from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. So God raised Jesus up. That's the great fact that proves that he is the Christ, the Savior, the Son of God, that he died for our sins. Uh, well, we could say, well, that's what it says but how do we know God accepted it well God raised him from the dead we know God accepted Jesus and why he died uh, only God could do that and he raised him from the dead so he could show us that Jesus death was pleasing in his sight and that sacrifice was acceptable it proved that uh, he's the one that all men should consider the Lord he gave that great proof to us and Jesus appeared for over 40 days how many you know, 
just like at a trial, how many witnesses does it take to be sufficient to prove a point? And you go, well, that, that's enough witnesses. We've proved it. How many days did he have to appear to people at different places and times and <laughs> to show he really is raised from the dead? Forty days is how many days he appeared. And he appear, appeared to qualified people, people that knew him, ate with him, <laughs> knew him better than, you know, lived with him. Those are the people he appeared to that came from Galilee. And those people, he, Paul says, are out there right now preaching. <laughs> These people, remember when Paul is preaching this, we're, we're in what, about 48, 49? He was crucified and raised in 30. So this is what, 18 years later? <laughs> that these, these men are out there. They're preaching and telling their witness about seeing Jesus. The other apostles were preaching in other parts of the world to the Jewish people and uh, doing their work. So he says they're out there. These witnesses right now are preaching. Those women he appeared to, uh, he says those witnesses are testifying right now, given this same evidence. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled His promise to our children in that He raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. So Paul says we're preaching the good news. What's another word for good news? <laughs> What's the other word? Gospel. That's the word gospel, right? The gospel's the good news that God did all the things He promised He would do in sending a Savior. The good news that what He promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and all of those people, He has done that. And those promises are here for us and our children right now, that they could enjoy those blessings. Uh, he was going to bless all the nations of the earth in Abraham's seed, and Jesus is that seed. I'm going to have a ruler that will sit on the throne forever, promised to David. And Jesus is sitting on that throne. And it was talked about in the second psalm that God would raise up Jesus. You know, every time it says raise up Jesus, it isn't talking about the resurrection. Right? There's another sense in which somebody's raised up. You're raised up when you're brought into the scene of history. That's being raised up. And Jesus came into this world, and the second psalm talks about that. And that led to him being lifted up to God's right hand in the end. And part of the stepping stone to getting to God's right hand was dying on the cross and being resurrected. But it seems here he's saying he's brought Jesus into the world as he said that he would. He's raised him up. Just like he said, today I have begotten thee in the second psalm. You are my son and I've made you the king. And then he proved it further by raising him from the dead. So they go together, but they're not exactly the same. In the next verse, he'll talk about the resurrection again. But he has uh, brought him to the scene. Now he's been raised up, uh, resurrected, and now he's our high priest. He's uh, God's son in a special way. The Hebrew writer spends quite a bit of time with that, doesn't he? So that Jesus got a name given to him in the second psalm that's never given to angels when he says, my son, the son of God. That's never given to angels. They're sons of God, but they're not the son. That's only given to Jesus, the Christ. And the words are spoken to him. He's raised and uh, need to understand the import from the time he came into the world and went up to heaven. And as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no more to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. So God raised him from the dead, never to return to the grave. So he's going to be uh, referring back to Psalm 16. That it, it's the same thing Peter preached on Pentecost. He used Psalm 16 to prove the Old Testament foretold the resurrection of the Christ and that the Christ would not stay in the tomb long enough to decay. Right? He would... He would rise again and never go back to decay. Uh, so when David wrote Psalm 16, he wasn't talking about himself. So he also spoke in this way about the success uh, that he would give to all of us the holy and sure blessings of David. How, how do we get these spiritual holy blessings that come through David? 
Well, they come through Jesus. And they're only made possible because He died for us on the cross and He's ascended back to heaven. That's the only way we can get those sure, dependable, holy blessings. The resurrection makes that possible, Paul says. He can now give us a new covenant and give us forgiveness of sins. It all uh, comes uh, through David's son that we're able to enjoy those things. Verses 35 through 37 says, Therefore he also says in another psalm, this would be Psalm 16, You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. So you read Psalm 16 and it says that he is, his flesh is going to dwell securely. <laughs> right? He's not undergo decay. His soul's not going to be left in Hades. He's going to be raised from the dead. And he says, David wasn't talking about himself in Psalm 16. <laughs> David died. He was buried. His body decayed. Went back to dust, right? So David in Psalm 16 was not talking about himself. He had to be talking about that one that's coming from him, <laughs> the Christ. He foretold the resurrection of Christ from the dead when he wrote those things. So... It's the same argument Peter used in Acts 2.27. He makes the, uh, you know, there's just one gospel that they're all preaching, right? Whether it's Paul or Peter, they're all preaching one faith. And uh, uh, when I study with people today, I go to Psalm 16 and do it. I present it just like Peter and Paul did. <laughs> Here's the proof. It, a thousand years before Jesus was born, it was foretold he would not undergo decay. He would rise from the dead. So the psalm could not refer to David. It had to refer to the Christ that comes from David, his, his uh, seed. And he would be raised up from the dead. And of course, there's David's tomb in Jerusalem. <laughs> Peter said, his tomb is with us to this day. We know where David is. David, wa David wasn't raised. His body's right over there. Right? Christ is the one it speaks of. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren that through Him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through Him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Well, it says, how did Peter, what did Peter do on the first sermon? He said, now let everybody know assuredly that God has raised this same Jesus, made Him both Lord and Christ, right? Um, this is the way Paul ends with an exhortation too. He says that through him you can have forgiveness of sins. Now you can be saved through this Christ that died and was buried and was raised again. He is the one that can save you. And he told them that if you believe in Christ, he can set you free. And literally there, uh, justify you. Justify means to declare not guilty. And if you're declared not guilty as a man standing trial, what does that mean? You are free to go, right? It is freedom, right? That's another way you could translate it. You're justified. Not guilty. This court's adjourned, right? And everybody can go home. That's what Jesus can do. He can justify you, cause you to be declared not guilty by forgiving your sins. And you can go free. And you can go free from things the law of Moses could never set you free from. It could not justify you. It could point out your sin to you really good. It was good at that. Show you all the things that you're supposed to do, and if you do wrong, you're, you're dead. Now the law of Moses can point out your sins. It, it's, a, it's a covenant of condemnation. We're under a new covenant now, a covenant of life, where we can be set free by the blood. So, it says, uh, it can set you free from your sins, from your bad, your defiled conscience. Yeah, I'm, that's the good news we're proclaiming to you through the resurrection of Christ. That uh, there's a sacrifice that can cleanse you, not just in your flesh or ceremonially like the Old Testament sacrifices. It'll cleanse your soul. <laughs> Isn't that good news? Isn't that worth being here to celebrate today? Man. We've got a new covenant where we can get our conscience clean when we go to God. Uh, 
Uh, you must put your faith in him, though, to get that complete justification. And it starts, of course, when you initially obey the gospel in baptism. But that, we need that cleansing blood all the time, right? day in and day out. It's still there to justify us when we go to God. So it says we can, we've got a system now because of Christ that can save us. And then all of a sudden the tone of everything changes. <laughs> Paul's preaching along here and it's going great and he's appealing to them and then all of a sudden it's like, and if you people don't listen, you're all going to be in big trouble. Don't you think he must have seen something on their faces that they're like skeptical? They're rejecting what he's saying? Now, if, 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 he's, if they're all just coming along, wouldn't you just go on and keep on exhorting them, be saved from this perverse generation like Peter did? But the tone of the sermon changes right at the end. And I, I felt that way sometimes in a class or in a sermon. I look out at people and I can see they're, they're, rege they're rejecting this, you know. They're not going with this. We, gotta, we need to go another way, you know, to get to, through to somebody. And I guess he looked out there and saw that because to, he says there at the end, Take heed, therefore, so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish. For I am accomplishing a work in your day, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. <laughs> oh, wow, what a, way to, what a way to end the sermon after all the positive things and foundation that he laid up to that point. So you can see there's a resistance among this group of people. And they need to give them a warning when he closes the sermon. He quotes from the book of Habakkuk. If you've read Habakkuk, uh, Hopefully you have, you might reread it. It starts off, you know, with Habakkuk is complaining to God about all of this unrighteousness and ungodliness that's going on in Israel all around, and why isn't God doing anything about it? And he says to Habakkuk, I'm doing a work in your day, and even if I describe it to you, you won't believe it. <laughs> I'm raising up Babylonians right now, and they're going to come in here and punish all of these sinners in Israel. And then, of course, the book goes on and Habakkuk says, well, they're worse than us. What are we going to do about that? They're going to come in. And he says, well, I'm going to take care of them when I get through taking care of you. Right? Then I'm going to deal with the Babylonians. And so God's got a plan. It's working. Will you believe it? And, of course, Paul is making the application here. God is doing a work in the first century. Right? He sent John. He sent Jesus. He sent the apostles. They're doing these miracles and preaching the gospel and we're describing God's work of salvation to you and you're resisting it? What's going to happen to you if you keep closing off your heart from what the Word of God says? It says uh, you're going to perish. That's what's going to happen if you're a scoffer. If you reject the gospel and don't obey this word of salvation God sent out and harden your hearts and don't believe... The things the prophets said happened to unbelievers in the Old Testament are going to happen to you. And it did come to pass that way, didn't it? Those that resisted among the Jews, they weren't. Jerusalem was destroyed. The whole Jewish country was destroyed. It happened within that 40 years of the death of Christ. So the warning seems to be something that causes the people to... Uh, Think this over. <laughs> what would you think? I mean, the preacher just all of a sudden just blasts you at the end of the sermon. Like, you hard-hearted people, you better listen or you're going to perish. What's the reaction when he leaves the synagogue? He and Barnabas just head out, go out of the synagogue. What do the people do? It says, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Maybe we better hear this again. Please come back and he preach this next week. So I don't argue with Paul's wisdom there, do you, or the Holy Spirit's wisdom in that you close the sermon with just blasting everybody and walking out the door? <laughs> That's what he did. And evidently it woke some of them up to go, man, we better hear this again. This is serious business. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. So... That's, that's, a, that's good with these people. I mean, isn't it all, always that way, usually in a crowd of people? You're preaching and you've got some that are they're resisting what you've got to say. And 
But there's other people, they're ready to follow you home. Let's study some more. I'd like to hear some more about this grace of God and this salvation that you're talking about. And so, just like at Athens, we're going to read, you know, when we get to chapter 17, that council, that those judges rejected the gospel. But there were others that went with Paul and listened uh, and paid attention. Yes. Yeah, sure, certainly. It it makes you, I mean, it's like Jesus said with the, the, the Pharisees, you know, it said they claim to see. Well, if you see then and you don't obey the gospel, that's even worse, right? You're worse off than you were before. Here, this good news has been announced to you and you turn your back on it. What do you think is going to happen? You know, it's going to be worse. You've got this great opportunity. You've got John the Baptist. You've got Jesus. You've got the apostles. You've got all of this and you turn your back on it? What do you think is going to happen? It's going to be just like back there in the Old Testament when the Babylonians came and wiped them out. It's going to happen. Uh, so it does wake some of them up. Thankfully, they want to hear more. Was that the first bell? First bell. Okay. <laughs> uh, first bell. Heard it that time. W- once the crowd is dismissed, then they start following the apostles. Some of them do. And I'd like to picture myself being in that group. <laughs> hey, Paul, can we study some more? That's what you'd hope, that we will be there. We'll be the ones seeking the truth. And then look at the next week. It says, the next, uh, the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. So you might think, well, that sermon was kind of a flop that first week. It wasn't a flop, <laughs> was it? Word got out about what he preached and how he ended the sermon and kind of electrified the whole town by the time it spread around. that this, These people are bringing a message from God in heaven about the Christ, the Savior of the world, and they're preaching on that down at the synagogue. And everybody's been talking about it all week long. And you can see there's a hunger in the New Testament days among Gentile people, among these Greeks and Romans. Their religion is bankrupt. They've, they've been worshiping these idols and false gods and their philosophies and they've led to nothing. And they're all looking for something. And here this message has come to town. And now the whole town turns out. Can you just imagine the, the rabbis and stuff that are at that synagogue? And they've never had a crowd like that. You know, they've been preaching there for years and they, you know, made a little progress maybe, but not, not the whole town turned out. And here these two guys come in Paul and Barnabas, and now the whole town's there. You think there might be some jealousy? <laughs> Rival, it's sad to say that pe- preachers would be jealous of each other or whatever, that happens all the time. And that's, <laughs> they're going to be upset that they're getting all this attention. Isn't that the way they treated Jesus? Why did they crucify him? Pilate knew it was envy that caused them to crucify him. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. So they're filled with jealousy. The word means envious and contemptuous rivalry. They don't like all this attention these Christians are getting coming into town preaching this message. And they begin to interrupt Paul, contradict He says, Psalms 16 says this, and Psalms 53 says that, and they say, oh, no, that's talking about something else, and they begin to contradict the Word of God. Oh, no, it doesn't apply to that. I've I've been there. (laughs) Oh, no, that doesn't mean what it says. Uh, It asserts, express the opposite of what he's trying to say, and they blaspheme. Uh, A lot of think blaspheme the Holy Spirit in the sense that this is the Holy Spirit's message, the gospel, and you're contradicting it and arguing with it. You're blaspheming the Holy Spirit when you do that. Or Jesus Christ saying, oh, he's a criminal. He's not the Christ. He died on the cross because he's a guilty sinner. He can't save you. I don't know. Maybe uh, that blasphemy is what they're thinking of. But they were speaking against the gospel and speaking against the truth and doing so reproachfully. In the presence of Paul. 
So how does Paul react to that? Saying, oh, well, if you don't like this message, I'll preach it the way you like it. <laughs> no. You preach the truth. You preach it the way it is. And if people don't like it, you take it to somebody else, right? You don't just force it down their throats if they don't want it. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. Since you repudiate it and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. So it says, you had your chance. God ordered it so, didn't he, that the Jews get the first chance. To the Jew first and also to the Greek was the order that God gave through Christ. First you preach to the Jews. They get the first opportunity for their father's sakes and for all the preparation they've had with the Old Testament. So you first preach to Jews when you go to a town. But after you've preached to them, then you go to the Gentiles. And Paul says, you guys have determined you don't want it, so we're going to take it to the Gentiles. Well, I think that was the second bell, so I'm going to stop there. And we'll look at the conclusion of the sermon and, and uh, the work there next time.